Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel. I'm Huck. Today I am doing a series discussion video about the Shades of Magic series by V.E. Schwab. So this is a series that I recently read and really enjoyed, but I have a lot of thoughts and feelings and opinions and some complaints actually to talk about, and so I'm going to be doing a spoilery discussion of these to just kind of put it all out there and just say all the things that I want to about this series. So if you haven't read this series and you don't want to be spoiled, for it, then you should probably stop watching because this is definitely going to have spoilers in it. I'm going to try and keep this as organized and as unrambly as I can, but it's probably going to get a little rambly. Alright, so if you are still here and watching, I'm going to assume that you've probably read this series and know what it's about, or at least know enough about it, uh, that I'm not going to really go in and describe it. I'm just going to kind of get into what I thought about each of these books, kind of going in order of each book. Before I get started, I do want to say, like, I did enjoy this series. It was a lot of fun. I have some complaints about it that, like, this is gonna get a little complainy, but just know, overall, I had fun reading this series and I did enjoy it, but there are some things that bugged me and I really want to talk about them. <laughs> so the first book in the series is A Darker Shade of Magic and this one really starts off the whole story and I enjoyed it in that it was pretty fast paced. It's definitely like it pulls you in. The story I really liked. Um, in this one I didn't care that much about the characters themselves and in general I'm a character driven reader but the story was interesting enough and fast paced enough that I did get kind of sucked into it. Kel I found kind of annoying because I felt like he was pointlessly reckless about things. Um, I understand that he doesn't have a perfect life because he has this, he's in this weird position where he's sort of like owned by the royal family, like he serves them but then they also kind of pretend like he's one of them and like one of their children but he never quite fits in. It's like a weird place to be and he's kind of like angsty about it but like the risks that he takes, he's just doing it for giggles. Like he's putting, he's breaking laws, but more importantly putting worlds in danger just because he's angsty, because he can, because he just wants to do it for giggles. I don't know. And then for Lila, I didn't have a strong opinion about her. I know she is usually the one that people have very strong opinions about because either people like love her or hate her. In this first book, I didn't have a strong opinion about her. I thought that she was fine. She also was kind of reckless, but to me it was more understandable and more acceptable um, because she has kind of lived a harder life. She has to take care for, of herself and look out for herself. She has to live as a thief. And so to some extent that kind of made it less annoying to me when she would make reckless decisions. Also because her reckless behavior impacts fewer people. It mostly just impacts her or like a couple of people, but doesn't endanger like worlds. So that also didn't like bother me as much about her. And to some extent for her, like she has had to survive and take care of herself. And whatever reckless decisions she makes, like to some extent it's working for her. She survived this long, you know? So even if they seem reckless, like to some extent, it's working. She's doing something kind of right because she's survived this long. Whereas for Kel, his reckless decisions have zero to do with survival. Like none of it has to do with survival. It's just because he's angsty and he wants to like entertain himself or feel like you don't really own me or whatever it is. So the second book is A Gathering of Shadows and this is the one where this video is gonna get a little complainy and like I swear it's gonna perk back up once we get to the third book but this one I found very frustrating for a lot of reasons and this is mostly what I want to complain about really. But before getting into the complaining, I do want to say I do really enjoy V.E. Schwab's writing, especially like the opening scene for this book was awesome. It felt like I was watching a movie as I was reading it, like I could see it in my mind. It felt like something out of like Pirates of the Caribbean. And I was like, I want to see this scene specifically, but even like this whole series 
as a movie. All right, now on to the complaining about this. The first thing that I want to say I did mention in my, I think, May wrap up when I talked about this is that this story, this book is very much a filler story, second book syndrome, whatever you want to call it. Like this book is pointless. Uh, because pretty much nothing important happens in it. There is like a minute amount of information that moves the plot forward and it could have just been included in one of the other books, either the end of the first book or the beginning of the other book, and not included the like, you know, 400-500 pages of pointless story that this is. Once again, I feel like the characters are kind of pointlessly reckless and I found that really annoying in this one. Kel, again, being very pointlessly reckless and putting tons of people at risk for his own just like angst and entertainment. Like I know that in this like he's feeling very um, trapped because of some of the decisions that he made and because now of how the king and queen are treating him and all of this stuff. But once again, Kel's decisions are putting not just himself at risk, but tons of other people at risk. So he's putting his own life at risk, but he's also putting Rai's life at risk now that their lives are linked together. And I know that it's Rai's idea for him to do this, but that doesn't mean it's a good idea. That doesn't mean that he should listen to Rai. And Rai is like the sole heir to Red London, and you can't put him at risk like that, even if it's his idea, even if he condones it. Like, that doesn't make it okay. But more importantly, he's putting the entire country at risk. They said that these games are like a political thing that they do to kind of bring the countries together and that the countries purposefully don't choose their very strongest magicians to fight because you don't want anyone to have too much of an advantage and that the countries would freak out if they knew that the Antari was competing because that wouldn't be fair and that could start a war. Like that's not, like Kel's angst is not worth starting a war. That's not okay. Like I don't care how angsty he is and how much he's feeling trapped or like it's not fair or whatever it is or how like weird his life has been. That's not worth starting a war over. And so again, he makes these stupidly reckless decisions that don't just impact himself. And it's not even, they don't just impact his brother Rai. They could impact country, multiple countries and get people killed. So I was just mad at him about that. And then of course there's Lila who in this one started to really annoy me. In the first one, I didn't have a strong opinion about her. This one, oh my god, she's so annoying. She's such a brat and she's so like, no one understands me. And also she does the like, I'm not like other girls. And I'm just like, oh my god, like, I, just, I don't even know what to say to you about this. Like, she was so frustrating. And she does all of this like, I'm not like other girls and I don't dress like other girls and all that, which is fine. Like, don't dress like other girls, but you don't have to be like, oh, I'm so different. And then there's this whole scene at some ball. I don't remember if the ball happens at the end of this one or at the beginning of the next book, but there's one where she shows up in a dress and there's that like moment where like Kel sees her for the first time in a dress and is like, whoa. And like, that's such a tropey moment. The fact that it's a trope doesn't even bother me that much because like, that can be a fun trope. That's a fun thing to happen sometimes in stories, you know, to have that like, woo kind of moment. But like, it felt so out of place in this story. That trope didn't make sense for this story, for this context, for these characters. It just like, un like this is nitpicky, I know, but that moment just annoyed me a lot and it just didn't fit. But the thing that bothered me the most about Lila in this book was the fact that she even entered the tournament or the games or whatever they're called because the thing is she shouldn't be able to be powerful enough to even compete. She should have gotten knocked out in the first round. Like we get it, she's on Tari, like that was very heavily hinted and like that was an interesting aspect of the story. But like no matter how powerful she is, 
she doesn't know what she's doing at all. She just found out that she's Antari, that she has any kind of magical powers. This book takes place four months after the first one. So she has known that she has magical powers for four months, okay? That's not enough time. She has had a haphazard, like, small amount of training from Alucard on a ship for four months. She should not be able to compete in the games, not like rules-wise, but just like ability-wise. There are people in these games who have been training their entire lives how to use and perfect their magic. Kel, who has been training his entire life as an Antari, like, these people were giving him a run for his money. Like, yes, he won every time, but it wasn't easy for him. And he actually knows what he's doing. Lila, like, I don't care how powerful she is. She doesn't know anything. She doesn't have enough training. She shouldn't be able to have lasted that long in the tournament. And I know they have the whole, like, they've never had to fight for their lives, but she has and she's resourceful. That's still not enough still not enough to justify how well she did in the games. I don't, don't care. I just was so mad about this. I was like, this makes zero sense. She should have been out in like the first round. And now we're on to A Conjuring of Light, the last book in the series, but this is where the discussion gets a little more chipper because I loved this book. This was great. This was my favorite book of the series. I think that there are a couple of reasons that this one was so great and so much better. One is just that we get back to the actual plot of the story because the first one really started off the plot. The second one, as I said, very pointless and didn't need to be there. This one, we get back to the plot that was started in that first book. And I really enjoyed that part of it. I think also what I liked about it is that we get a lot more character development. We get a lot more um, understanding the characters, learning more about them and their backstories. Everybody seems to have a really sad backstory in this, but I loved it. It made me like just really feel for these characters and that's that's really why I read these books. I really just want to like deeply feel for these characters and feel connected to them. And I think that I also liked this one better because we got to learn a lot more about the side characters like Rai and Alucard and Holland and we had less of a focus on Kel and Lila and they got less like page time so they were less annoying. And up until this point I didn't really have any favorite characters or any characters I was especially attached to but now I have two characters that I really really love one of which is Rye and the other is Holland so I'm gonna talk about that Rye is just the like little ball of sunshine and I love him and that like he's just such, he was such a happy sunshiny person and just like always trying his best and then like terrible stuff happens to him in this book. No, actually terrible stuff happened to him at the end of the first book and then second book and now in the third book. Like all this bad stuff happens to him. So he's pretty much died twice now, which I'm sure is very traumatic. And he's not even sure if now that he's alive, is he really living or is he some kind of weird half-life creature? And that conflict for him was really interesting and very compelling I thought. I wish there had actually been a little bit more about that and a little bit more about his process but I just love him so much and that he was still trying so hard to maintain who he is but he took that and he made the best of it that he still went out into the city to help his people, to find the ones who were not infected by the magic, who were still surviving, who he could still save, because he knew that he couldn't be infected by the magic, that he can't die, and I really loved that about him. He could have just like curled up into a ball and just like done nothing and had like an existential identity crisis but he didn't he really rose to the occasion and he took the best parts of himself and used those to overcome these this terrible situation that he was having and still make the best of it and still help his people and it really showed that he's more than just like this happy-go-lucky guy that he's going to be able to be a really good king who cares 
for his people. And then the other character that I really liked was Holland, um, because he is sort of like the villain, obviously, but he, we get to learn so much more about him and he becomes so much more understandable. We learn about his backstory and like, he has such a sad backstory, oh my god, like so, why does everyone try to murder Holland? Like why is everyone trying to kill him? Oh my gosh. But we get to learn more about his backstory and kind of what events have shaped him and how he has come to where he is now and that even through that again he persevered you know he got himself through it and he still has kind of like a glimmer of hope that he still loves white london for whatever reason because it seems like a terrible place but it's his home and he loves it and he wants it to survive and thrive and he just he so much wants to help it he still loves his London that he's from and he's still trying to help it he just wants to help it so badly and like maybe his decisions aren't the best but again it was understandable I really liked the dynamic between Alucard and Kel that both of them love Rye so much but they hate each other so much and the way they would just like clash and butt head and we also get more information about the king and queen which I really liked because they were kind of these like weird distant figures who had a very big influence on Kel and Rai but we didn't know very much about them so I really liked that we got to learn a little bit more about like the king's backstory and the queen's and a lot about like the queen's process. Now I do have a ship that did not happen in this series but I really really wanted it to and I don't think anyone else cares about this ship because I tried looking it up online and I can't find anything about it um, but I really shipped Holland and Rai together. I wanted them to get together like from the very first book. There's almost no reason to think that the two of them would get together. There's no like hints in the book that they would and I didn't think that it would happen. But I still wanted it really badly. And I feel like they would be so good together and they would be so cute together because like Rai is just like this little ball of sunshine and I feel like he would just help Holland. He could just make maybe like make him just like see that life can be happy, you know? Cause like Holland has had a pretty terrible life and just having somebody who can help him just see the joy of it, I feel like would be really good for him and that they might be able to balance each other really well. And I feel like Holland would be good for Rai, especially at this point, like maybe not at the very beginning, but by the end of the third book, Rai has had some terrible stuff happen to him and he has this new kind of like darker side to him and like these issues of like who is he and is he alive and dead and like all of that and I don't know how well other people really understand that and while Holland hasn't had those same experiences I feel like he could understand better what Rai is going through and maybe help Rai through that. So I feel like they would be so good together and I just really really want it and I couldn't find anything online about this ship. If anybody else ships them please let me know in the comments that I am not alone because I feel like no one else cares about this imaginary ship. Also if you know what their ship name is, if there is like an actual ship name that I can use to search stuff about this, please let me know that too or if you have any recommendations for like fan fiction about Ryan Holland, anything or fan art, whatever. I ship them. I want more content about the two of them because I didn't get any in any of these books. So if you know anything, let me know. Also, there are two things at the end that I have questions about. One being with Alucard and Rai, what is their relationship going to be now? Like I get it that they're together and I like the two of them together, but like can Rai and Alucard actually be together with Rai as the king? I just want to know like what what is their relationship status essentially? The other thing though that I was confused about is with um, Holland, he goes back to White London and then it's a little unclear but I'm pretty sure he dies um, and then for some reason it seems like now White London is like oh and now White London breathes again and it'll be fine now so like did somehow one is Holland actually dead two how does Holland dying help White London why why are those two things connected I don't understand so those are the things that I didn't 
I just want clarity on about this but I think she is writing another series in this world that will continue this so I am looking forward to that I'm hoping that it doesn't really focus on Kel and Lila because like I don't care about them but I am really interested to see what happens and hopefully get some of those questions answered. So that is all for my discussion of the Shades of Magic series. I know this is probably going to be a long video with a lot of rambling in it, so if you've watched this far, thank you all so much for watching. If you um, agree or disagree with any of the things that I said in here, please let me know. I'd love to discuss these books with you in the comments, especially if you have stuff to say about Rye and Holland together, because that is a ship that I'm very committed to. So as I said, thank you all for watching, and until next time, bye!